Ride the coaster, get cool in the waves in the pool, you'll have fun. So come on over. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Vince Gargiulo, and I wrote this book right here, Palisades Amusement Park, A Century of Fond Memories. I was one of the producers of the PBS documentary that uh, you might have seen in, in the New York Marketplace on Channel 13. Uh, today, I uh, maintain the official website for Palisades uh, for the Palisades Amusement Park Historical Society, uh, palisadespark.com. And um, I'm sure many of you are here from Facebook. I have the Palisades Amusement Park Historical Society on Facebook. Um, and uh, last season and this season as well, I'm the curator of the Palisades Amusement Park exhibit at the Mawa Museum. Um, remember, if you want to be kept up to date on any um, Palisades Amusement Park uh, events that are happening at the museum, um, please feel free to go to their uh, website, mawamuseum.org. And at the very bottom, you'll see a link to join our mailing list. Um, click there, sign up, and we'll keep you informed. Uh, like Charlie said, February 20th, I'll be doing the history of Palisades Amusement Park. Again, um, uh, as, as a webinar, probably. Um, and it's free, so please uh, you know, feel free to check it out. Tonight, we have some incredible guests, all of which had... Uh, very good insight into the workings of Palisades Amusement Park. We'll get to meet them all. Um, we have Gene Focarelli, who worked the lemonade, lemonade stand at the park. Uh, we have uh, Chris Page, who's a great, great grandfather, um, uh, built the first Penny Arcade at the park way back in 1915. Um, we have Donald Jacoby, who is the grand nephew of park owners Jack and Irving Rosenthal. And we have um, the best selling author, uh, Alan Brennert. Um, and we'll get to meet them all a little later. Right now, first, let's, let's get started with Gene Focarelli. By the way, if you have any questions um, for any of our guests, just please type them in the, in the uh, chat box at the bottom. And um, Q&A box. It says Q and A, yeah, that's what I meant in the Q and A in the Q and in the Q and A box at the bottom, and uh, uh, Ken will be looking at them, and we'll we'll be uh, we'll we'll try to get to as many questions um, as possible uh, before we're all through. My first guest, Gene Focarelli, he worked the lemonade stand that was right next to the pool in 1968 and 69. Um, he grew up in Cliffside Park. Uh, Gene, thanks for joining us. Hi. I'm really glad to be here. And before we get on uh, with this, I'd just like to put out to everybody that thank you very much to Vince Gargiulo for keeping Palisade Amusement Park alive. Without your efforts, um, I think it would have been like what happened to the roller coaster. Uh, it would have just been, been gone. Uh, there's a plaque uh, because of your efforts by uh, where it used to stand um, by Winston Towers and uh, your books and uh, the Palisade Amusement Park Historical Society, everything. You keep Palisade Amusement Park alive. And the little miniature at the, at the museum is just phenomenal. It's just wonderful. So my personal thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So tell me, let, let's, let's talk about you and, and Palisades. What were your responsibilities um, in working at the park? My responsibilities was just make nice ice cold lemonade. Um, next door was French was the French fry stand, so uh, they would get French fries. They would come over and get a lemonade, and then they would make. If they turned around, they could go to where uh, the bandstand was and go see all the the wonderful acts. And if I leaned out enough uh, from the lemonade stands, I could see uh, the acts. I can hear them all the time, but uh, leaning out. But it was always crowded. There, there was always a, a ton of people there waiting for the ice cold lemonade. But that's what made Palisade successful were the crowds. Yeah. So tell me, what was the secret? Can you give us any inside look at the secret to that delicious right, right, lemonade? Right, I'm right. sure anybody who's, who's had that lemonade certainly remembers it. Can you give us any? Uh, right. Don't let this get out. Secret recipe. <laughs> okay. okay, you had your glass and you had your half a lemon. You only had a half a lemon and you squeezed the juice out of it. You poured it into the cup. You put a couple of spoonfuls of sugar. 
you put some ice in it, put water in it, shake, 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 pour it into a, into a plastic cup and you gave it to the people and they're, and they're waiting and they're waiting and they, and they, they basically drink half of it while standing in front of you. Yeah. And then most, most of the time they would just walk a couple of feet, turn around and get another one. <laughs> Do you remember how much, how much a lemonade cost back then? I'm going to say maybe a quarter if it was that much. It was probably 25 cents. Yeah. Yep. Now, I remember with the stands that, with all the lemonade stands that they had in the park, there was always these gigantic lemons that hung from the inside rafters of the booth. Um, what was the deal with those? Uh, on the bottom, there was a little spigot. So when I was there, it wasn't functioning, but I assuming that it was just water. That's where, that's where you turn it and that's where you got the water from. Lemonade didn't actually come out from that lemon. It would, that, no. that may have just had water. Yeah, but yeah. when I was there, it was, it was just for show. It wasn't, it wasn't functioning. But I'm sure back in the day that uh, there was, there was a, a water pipe connected to that so they can get the water from there. Yeah. Now, you, you said your stand was close to the, to the free act stage. Yes. So on a weekend, like, I mean, did you ever have a chance to actually get out of the stand, maybe take a break and see some of the yeah, artists? I yeah, I, we had a deal with the French fry stand. They they couldn't give it to us in the contain in the cups because they were counted. Um, so they would give us, you know, they 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 cut the box where the where the containers came in and give us French fries, and we would give them uh, make them lemonade. So I would take a lemonade, I would take some French fries in the box, and just walk down to the uh, free act stage. And uh, you know what was my break? Uh, Fifteen minutes or so, and and just and just stand there and eat the French fries with the, um, uh, there was no ketchup allowed. There was malt vinegar and salt and, uh, and drink the lemonade and then say, okay, go back, go back to work. But like I said, just lean out. You were able to see the, the ax on the stage. And across for what was a little penny arcade that ironically, my grandfather used to uh, work there. Many oh, is that right? Yeah. What was your favorite ride at the park? You got to ride on most of the rides that were there, right? Yeah. Um, the Cyclone at the end, uh, but the one that got me all the time that I really liked because it was the Wild Mouse. Because the Wild Mouse, you'd go up, you know, and it would turn really, but then it would go like you were going off the end of the cliffs mm -hmm. and going into the Hudson River. It but was just a great coaster, land, great wooden coaster. Land, at the last second, it would make that turn. But you knew that you were safe, but you always just had that uh, one uh, microsecond of doubt, yeah, which made it, right, made it spectacular. Right. And, and part of what, what made that ride so special was you were sitting in a car that only held up to two people, I think. That's and it. the yeah. wheels were set back. So as it, 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 all the curves were very sharp. So because the wheels were set back, the front end of your... Um, of the of your car actually was looked like it was going off the track we're going and it, off we're, and it was but then it would make that that sharp turn and yeah that was a, i i agree with you for a coaster that was one of my favorite coasters ever yeah yeah um and you remember they had batting cages yes right. uh, i was in the, the cliffside park little league and uh, the coaches would take us there because there was no batting cages that I remember anywhere um, and take us as a team with our uniforms on and go there for practice. Uh, Saturday mornings, um, you know, when there was a holiday from school and uh, I'm not sure what it cost. Was it maybe 10 cents or 25 cents and you get, I don't know how many balls, but it was a place to, to actually practice and get your swing down. Um, it, was, it was really a lot of, and plus you're in the, you're in the park. And a lot of kids, especially a lot of the local kids, certainly got a lot of their uh, early Little League practice at Palisades. Oh, yeah. 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 The, people have said that Palisades, um, it attacked every sense, uh, you know, the taste of the lemonade and the colors of the, uh, I mean, the neon uh, lights at night were, were spectacular to look at. Um, I remember the smells of Palisades. I, I remember the smells of those French fries you were talking about. What, yeah. Do you have any memories like that? 
Yeah, uh, from where the lemonade stand was, was right next to the pool, to the right, the pool was there. But then you'd go up a hill, and at the top of that hill was the Belgian waffles. And man, if you had some, you had some change in your pocket, you got Belgian waffles with the strawberries on it and that fresh whipped cream, nothing better. And that smell was, was tremendous. Yeah. I, you know, I agree cool. with you. And I remember it was, it was because that, that particular waffle stand you're talking about was so close to the pool. It was this mixture of the saltwater spray that was coming from the, from the uh, waterfall that was in the pool. That was mixed with that vanilla smell of the waffles. And it oh, was a, man. <laughs> I wish they could put that in a spray can. Uh, like um, do you remember the Fun House? Yes, the, the Fun House was, was really cool. It had just, it was like a thousand things to do in it. You know, you just didn't walk through it. It was just so many things to do. But what I liked was that giant wooden tube that everybody tried to stand up and go around and go around. And you get so far, boom, and you go down. <laughs> that thing was hard, but you still, you got up and you tried to do it again. That was really cool. I just stood there and stared, and then the guy would show me where the door was, so I didn't have to go through <laughs> it to exit the place. Um, any favorite memories of the park before we open this up for uh, Q and A? Well, living in Cliffside Park, um, I was on the other side of Lawton Avenue. Um, still, I was able to hear the click, 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 click of the cyclone, and then silence, and then scream. And we heard that. I'm sure it, yeah. all of Cliffside Park heard it. But it, it's, the, it's the smells, it's the sights. When you got closer to the park, as a kid growing up, we, if you didn't, we didn't have any money. So you go around town looking for a, match, uh, a matchbook. And if you were okay with the matchbook, you can get in for free. And there was always something, a strip of tickets on the floor or something. But if you, were, if you were lucky, you took down the striker and you saw the little pal figure, you were able to get a strip of tickets. And I think you got a hot dog and a soda with that. I'm, I'm I think it was sure. a couple of free rides if, if, if the little pal guy was in the match. The little pot pal was but there. there. Was so, but, and it, living in town too, if you walked into any of the stores on Anderson Avenue, um, there were piles of discount tickets, which got you the free admission and then if you brought that ticket to the administration booth, I think that's when you got a strip of tickets for 85 cents or something like that. Just growing up there. Hey, what do you want to do today? Let's go to the park. That's what we called it. We called it the park. Let's and and the park. I lived a block away from you in Cliffside. And, uh, you know, we were very blessed to be able to have someplace like Palisades that was our playground. I mean, literally. How about opening day for school? They closed, closed the school last day, last day of school. Oh, last day of school, it was, we, we had, a, we had a, a parade yep. all going to the park. Come and, on. That, and that was something that the Rosenthal brothers, the owners of the park, that was something that they did um, right up until the end. They made a deal with, the, with all the public schools in Cliffside and Fairview. And um, on the last day of school, all the kids from, from the different schools would march in a parade. And it was a big deal. I mean, town officials, the mayor and the police department and everything was part of the parade, the high school marching band. And one by one, each school would, would you know, uh, get in line. They would march their way up to the park. Then they would give them that strip tickets, the combination tickets, which had rides. And that's where there was always a food uh, ticket, a hot dog and probably a lemonade uh, on that. And although the park gave all of that for free to all the kids in town, um, they knew, you know, they, they were good businessmen. They knew that parents would meet the kids there and the parents would pay to get in, you know, aunts, uncles, everybody would kind of join in. And it was a, a, a great day of fun. It's, and especially for the kids that that became the traditional last day of school for, for many Yes, of it was. Kids. Yes, it was. And there was some kind of rumor going on that there was a hole in the fence. <laughs> oh. I don't know. Maybe we can talk about it. I'm not sure. Yeah. You know, I would, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Donald uh, uh, tell us about the hole in the fence. But, uh, Gene, I want to thank you. Uh, Ken, is, do we have any questions so far? We do. We do. Yeah, we do. Let me, uh, one is, uh, what happened to the carousel horses? The carousel horses stayed with the carousel. Although uh, Irving could have made a fortune if he, if he broke up the carousel when the park closed and sold it as piecemeal. 
because um, back then it was really very chic to to own a carousel horse. Um, and he could have made a fortune with it, but he wanted the carousel to live on. Um, and it goes on for a couple of pages in my books. It, it, it talks about what happened to the carousel after it closed. But uh, long story short, it's in Canada's Wonderland. And I think it's Ontario, Canada. And they refurbished it. And the, the, uh, the carousel is still in operation today and still looks wow. as great as ever. Outstanding. How great is that? Road trip. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> we need to get a picture of the carousel today. Yes, uh, yes. Any uh, other, this, go ahead, I'm sorry. Any other questions, Ken? Oh, yeah. Um, how old was Gene when he worked there? Uh, was this a summer job for you, Gene? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yeah, I was still in high school. So what, 16, 17? 15, 16. You could get working papers that, you know, Palisades yes. was, was the place. I think at 14, you could get 14 working papers. Yeah. And if you were a kid in town, they would give you a job. They'd find a yeah. job for you if you wanted to work. That's right. Okay. Um, is Hal Jackson still alive? He passed uh, a few years ago. I'm, I'm thinking five, five years ago or so. Who is your favorite act that you saw or heard while you were working? I guess that might be a question for Gene. Or yeah. I guess oh, boy. Um, uh, I love the Young Rascals. I remember <laughs> they were there. I remember seeing them there. Well, the Rascals later on. They weren't the Young Rascals anymore. But um, it's just every time I worked there, there was somebody on stage. It was, it was just magnificent. It was a great place to... Great place to be. I, and I think a lot of young people today would have no idea what it was like to live in a town where every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, were free concerts and not necessarily nobodies. I mean, you know, there were a couple of, you know, local bands that performed there. But, you know, Leslie Gore and the Jackson Five and the Fifth Dimension and... The I, Supremes. I mean, the, I, yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable yeah. how many people you know, how many uh, top 10 artists uh, you know, performed at, at the park, including uh, Tony Bennett. That was the place that they went to. They all wanted to play Palisade Amusement Park. Yeah. Uh, any uh, recollections of Anna Cook? Well, we'll get to Anna when I talk to Donald. Uh, okay. And Anna, uh, Anna was uh, the niece of Irving Rosenthal. Does anyone remember the sideshows? I remember uh, uh, Bruce actually is writing this. Uh, Bruce remembers a miniature pon pony. Yes, the, um, the, they had a freak animal show um, that was run by Arch and May McCaskill. And they had the world's small, smallest horse. They had the world's largest dog, which was a, uh, a St. Bernard. Um, they the cow had two a cow with two heads, a cow with six legs. Um, and really what it was, was, you know, the McCaskills loved their animals. Um, you know, a lot of people think there was something uh, inhumane about putting them on display, but farmers across the country knew of the McCaskills. And if their animal had a baby that was deformed in some way, well, most of the time before the McCaskills, you know, they would have just, you know, killed, you know, killed the, the animal because it, it, would, it would be a burden to them. But they knew that the McCaskills would pay money for their, um, for their animals with, with deformities. And they treated them like pets. Um, in the winter, they, they brought them all down to Florida where they, where they wintered. Um, so there was nothing inhumane about what they were doing. And it was fascinating for people to see and go on the inside and see these animals up close. Uh, do you remember Clay Cole and his shows at the bar? Yes, Clay was, um, well, Clay, Clay was televised. So he was to us what uh, Dick Clark was to Philadelphia. Um, you know, he had a, a, a weekly show that, that, that was aired um, from the casino that was by the pool. And um, he had all, he was, in fact, he was the first 
host in the United States to, to uh, show the um, Rolling Stones. That was the first televised appearance of the Rolling Stones was on the Clay Cole Show. The, uh, the question list is growing. Do you want to continue? Yeah, let's, let's go on with our guests. We'll, we'll get to okay. some questions later. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. I really appreciate it. This is wonderful. Gene, if you could stay with us, I'm sure we're oh, going to be I'm talking here. some yeah. more. All right, terrific. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, Jack and Irving Rosenthal. In 2018, Irving was honored by putting him in the Hall of Fame. From selling shovels and pails to beachgoers at age nine to building the iconic cyclone, Irving Rosenthal's Coney Island career was only the beginning for this creative entrepreneur. For over 60 years, he set new standards for marketing, licensing, cleanliness, and maintenance. He helped make Palisades Amusement Park one of the most famous parks in the world. And through importing European rides for his amusement park, Irving Rosenthal helped globalize the industry. We're, we're very fortunate to have with us now uh, Donald Jacoby, who is the grand nephew of Jack and Irving. Uh, Donald, welcome. Glad to be here, Vince. Thank you so much. Um, tell us a little bit about the Rosenthal family. It was, it was, there was more than just Jack and Irving, I'm sure. Well, there, there were eight of them. Um, they were amazing in all, in all their glory. Uh, and some of them were very simple and just led a very normal life. And then there was Jack and Irving and Anna. Anna was a cousin. Um, she, uh, in her own right, oh, there they are. Jack was a concert violinist. Uh, that's how a lot of the funds were eventually raised to rebuild the park after it burned, because uh, it was not insured. That's Jack. There's, there's Jack, yep. Jack was the first violinist of the St. Paul, Paul Symphony Orchestra. Um, at 13, he was already an accomplished violinist. That's impressive at 13. At 13. Uh, Don, w weren't there two of the Rosenthal children who was part of a great New York disaster back in the early days? Uh, yes, my grandmother and my grandmother's sister were in the Triangle Sewing Factory. Fire. That was Molly and Rebecca? That's correct. And Molly then the, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was a fire that happened... 1911. 1911. Yeah, I think you're right. Yes. And they, they survived that, didn't they? They survived due to uh, two of the students at, N at an NYU dorm that were directly across the street who laid a plank between the two roofs. And that's how they and wow. two other women got out. And Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, yeah, that's true. <laughs> there was another brother besides Jack and Irving who, who worked at the park. Yes, Sam. Uh, and Sam actually was in the handbag business in Brooklyn, but uh, when the park was in operation, he ran the parking lot. Uh, he was very verbal. He was very definitive in his needs and what he wanted and what he wanted the drivers to do. Uh -oh. And he made sure that there were no accidents in the parking lot. Okay. But he, he really wasn't active in any other of the operations of the park. And then somebody before asked about Anna, um, can you tell us a little bit about a lady named Anna Halpern, I guess, originally? Uh, uh, Anna Halpern was her first married name. Um, her uh, first husband was the uh, personal detective to uh, Mayor and Politeria in New York City. And eventually she remarried uh, Henry Cook, who was the president of the Carpenters Union and became active in the park after they married. And something that very few people know, on their marriage, Anna was given the saltwater pool as a gift and the receipts. <laughs> Anna actually ran the park at night. She was the night manager. Okay. All right. So her day would start when most people's day ended and then she would close the park and she loved to count money. There she is. There's Anna with, Anna with Irving. With Irving. Yep. And what an incredible gift to give your niece the swimming pool as a gift and she the person. She actually deserved it. She was one of the hardest working ladies I have ever known. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anna also had a hobby. She had uh, two lion cubs that she kept in the office with her. And when the park closed, uh, they were sent to a zoo. And every day, Anna would bring 50 pounds of meat for them. Oh, my Lord. 
And that goes back to the 70s. Yep. What, what kind of boss was Irving to his full-time employees? He was wonderful. Uh, Irving actually did something that uh, is almost unheard of today. To all of his full-time uh, employees, uh, health, health insurance was provided, no cost, to them and their families. And that was pretty rare for-, for Very rare. Uh, an amusement park, certainly. For I, an, I actually company. didn't. I actually didn't know that until I got a little bit older, uh, and I was soliciting my uncle for health insurance, and um, he turned me down uh, very graciously and told me that uh, he he was already taking care of it and told me how. I was amazed. Wow. Very nice. And Jack, who who was also running the the park with his brother, he he eventually got sick and took a lesser role in the daily running of the park. Yes, he did. He basically, in, in his final years, he did not even come in. But Irving kept his desk in uh, the administration building in Irving's office. It said Irving and Jack Rosenthal on the door. And uh, every now and then, Jack would come in and visit, but he really wasn't active. Mm. He was too sick. And Jack never married, but, but Irving did. Irving did. Correct. Irving was married to uh, Gladys, uh, who was, in her own right, she was a lyricist. She actually wrote the Green Bus song, uh, which, uh, there she is. She was quite a lady. She lived a very long time. Uh, I think she passed away at 102. Good Lord, God bless. Mm -hmm. didn't, didn't she write something that we probably all know? I'm sure she wrote a few things that, she prob that uh, you probably know. Um, as a matter of fact, I already have it set aside that uh, uh, when my time comes, it's going to be a gift to the museum. Well, it's very her kind. Her scripts very. and her uh, records, and she, she wrote a lot of music for Freddie Cannon. And, in the park a lot. and of course, she wrote the jingle to Palisades Amusement Park. She did. So, um, come most on people, over. Come <laughs> on over. Yeah, can anybody sing that of the panelists? I think easily we, <laughs> we probably could. Do we yeah, want to? That's the question. <laughs> um, well, Donald, that's some great insight into the lives of the Rosenthal brothers. I thank you. Um, please, folks, if you just indulge me for just two minutes, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the people that made this show possible tonight, uh, the Mawa Museum. Um, here's a short video, please. I hope you'll enjoy it. I first discovered the Mawa Museum when I attended a fabulous exhibit on one of the greatest guitar players in the world, and also a Mawa resident, Les Paul. It was a great exhibit filled with rich history, great photographs, and the sounds of Les Paul's music was everywhere. That's what won me over to the museum. And then last year, the museum opened their doors and their hearts and allowed me to construct a tribute to Bergen County's own Palisades Amusement Park. I am truly grateful to them, not only for giving me one season, but holding it over for a second season. This year I had the chance, I've added tons of new items to the display. So please, if you're in the northern New Jersey area, please drop by this season and check it out. You won't be sorry. But I say all this because the pandemic has hurt so many businesses that lost most of their revenue for the year, and the museum is no exception. So I'm asking you, go to mawamuseum.org and click the donate button and give them whatever you can. If you're in the area, you might consider an annual membership for you or for the whole family. It's not that expensive, and it'll provide you a whole year of fun and education at the museum. But here is something very special just for people watching this webinar. My book, which tells the entire history of Palisades Amusement Park, is now available through the museum's gift shop. With its 200 pages and a foreword by the legendary cousin Bruce Morrow, this book captures every fond memory of the famous New Jersey Fun Center. And while you might be able to find this book in your local bookstore or even on Amazon, only by buying it through the museum's gift shop can you get an autographed copy. And the proceeds from tonight's sale of this book go to the museum, so you are helping to keep the memories alive. And think about this. Before you know it, Christmas and Hanukkah will soon be here. An autographed Palisades Amusement Park book will make a perfect gift for anyone who remembers this wonderful place. And you don't even have to leave your house to get it. So go to mawamuseum.org and click on the link that says shop. In the book section, you'll find my book there as 
well as plenty of other great educational and historical books. Order now to ensure that you'll receive the book in plenty of time for the holidays. Thank you for listening, and now let's get back to the Palisades Amusement Park webinar. My next guest is a uh, fellow whose uh, great Grant, great great grandfather, that's two greats, um, uh, was Philip Mazaki, and who, he, that's the man who opened the original Penny Arcade at Palisades Amusement Park way back in 1915. Um, Chris, hi, thanks for being with us tonight. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Chris. Um, tell us a little bit about your great great grandfather, Bonfiglio, otherwise known as Philip Mazaki. All right, so. Philip Mazaki's family owned a grocery store in Newark uh, prior to 1915, the early 1900s. Um, Philip and a friend, August Bernie, wanted more in life. Uh, they opened up uh, a ski ball concession at Palisade Amusement Park. Uh, the ski ball concession consisted of 20 or 25 or so alleys. Um, and after that, they had then purchased more machines, penny arcade machines, and um, opened the second concession at the amusement park in 1925, 1930 or so. So that, those were the early years of them being in the park, you know, and. Uh, and yeah. then eventually your great grandfather took over from Bonfiglio. That is correct. Yes, that was, that was after the fire. That was when the uh, larger arcade had been built. That was in 1955. That was my great grandfather George and his wife Angela. That was most likely in the larger arcade, probably in 1960 or so. That photo. Okay. So, yeah. And then you said um, you, you you mentioned a fire that happened in '44. That's correct. So in 1944, the Virginia Reel, I believe it was, caught on fire, and um, that was located right across from the <clears throat> from the Penny Arcade, which was a semi-open wood structure at the time. Um, the entire building burned down, all the machines had burned, and um, there were photos of, right there, people collecting pennies and nickels and dimes off the ground. So that's you know, probably the arcade these people are standing on. That, that is the arcade, and if you look right next to the gentleman on the right, there is a safe with the door open there. Okay, They're actually, yep. those are people most likely from Cliffside going through, you know, going through the rubble, collecting coins off the ground, and um, early on the morning after, uh, I know, I believe it was my great grandfather, George, my grandmother said, had gone there, opened up the safe and uh, inside the safe, all the dollar bills had been charred, of course, beyond recognition. And they, there was actually a clump of metal. All the coins in the safe had melted together. Wow. And uh, that's how intense the fire was. And your grandmother still has that, that clump of metal. She, she had it. She has no idea what she did with it. Oh, no. Because I would have it, obviously. <laughs> yeah. It's probably still in her attic in Cliffside with probably. when she sold the house. Probably, yeah. yeah. Now, there wasn't just one penny arcade, because Gene mentioned that there was an arcade across from his uh, uh, lemonade stand. How many, how many arcades do you think that your family had in the park? So in the early days, there were two, I believe. Or my Aunt Terry had even said at one point, one might have burnt down there was a 1925 fire or, or an earlier fire before 1944. 30, and, there was and, one in 34, 1934, yeah. Okay, gotcha. All right. And then pro, after the fire, in the later years of the park, we, we had three concessions there. They had the large arcade, which consisted of over 400 mach machines or so. Uh, that's the large arcade. Uh, in the background of that photo, you see Philip Mazaki behind the change booth all the way in the background. Um, there was a smaller ski ball concession, and there was an arcade that I was that I believe was called the Recreation Building. That was more so toward the front of the park, by the administration building. Now, this picture, with all of the um, uh, the the telescopes, ca uh, the the movies, yeah. um, this was the large arcade, correct? That is that is correct. Yes, yeah. yes, and that is right. And That's the large arcade. And this, this machine, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but this machine right in the front, this machine was donated to, to uh, the Palisades Historical Society. Um, and I've been trying to get this thing to work. Um, it's, it's a money pit, but someday Not, I'll, it's been I'll sitting get it for 50 work. years, right? Yeah. Not easy to get them going. No. I, actually, I actually got my hands on a uh, Apollo rifle uh, gun game last year. Oh, really? 
that I intend on working on. Yes. So. Well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll ask for your help on this one. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and this is also the large arcade, correct? That, that is correct. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. You, you recently um, obtained one of the original games from the park. This is the game you, you originally got? That is correct, yes. So, and then you, what I didn't realize until we chatted just last week is yep. that you did most of the restoration of this That is correct. Of this I, game. Yep, I had a little bit of help on the cabinet itself. You would look at the uh, coin mechanism had been altered and um, all of the all of the nickel plated components of the machine, <clears throat> you know, had corrosion on them. And yeah, I had everything chrome plated and uh, the cabinet, I had help restoring it and repairing it, get, getting the coin mechanism back to the original uh, push coin slide. And that's the restored machine right there. And that and I mean, the, the quality of the work on this is just phenomenal, Chris. My, my hat's off to you, sir. Thank you. That, that machine had sat, my grandmother owned a four family apartment building on Wayne Avenue, right down the block from the park. And, and any machines that weren't sold when the park closed, were put in that basement and sat there from 1971 until 1998. And I found the guy who bought that machine out of her basement in 1998. He had photos of it. And I purchased that machine about three years or so ago. And um, it had wow. just sat for 50 years. You know? Very, very nice job on it. Yes. Um, now, both your grandmother and your grandfather also worked at the park. So, I mean, it's, it's, this is definitely a family affair when it came That's to the correct. Penny Arcade. Not only, not only did they work in the park, my, my mother did. My father uh, worked for Eddie the Pollock at the balloon stand. Oh, my goodness gracious. Um, Joan worked the Duck Pond. Um, Pierre worked in the Penny Arcade. There's uh, my, my grandfather, Pierre, my grandmother, Joan, and their son, Jimmy. Um, Pierre worked in the Penny Arcades from when he came over here from Italy in 1957. Um, after George had passed away in 65, Pierre went to work directly for Irving Rosenthal, running the Cyclone for the last six years of the park. That's Bruno Musa, the co-owner of um, the Penny Arcade in later years. And who's uh, the cute baby? That's my mother. <laughs> that's Joan <laughs> and Pierre's daughter. Uh, so that photo is probably 1957. You can see it's probably late winter right uh the park the pool the oh pool sure yeah yeah you know yeah um yeah so a lot of history in the park since I, i'm 32 years old i never made it into the park but my whole life all i heard was was palisade amusement park stories and um i've heard hundreds of them you know but you you know your family had such a connection with that park and certainly if the park would have went on another 10 years you would have been working there and 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 had an important job there too. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. All right, Chris, thank you so much. If you could stick around with us, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna have questions later. Absolutely, thank you for having me, everybody. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you so much. Right. Um, now, my next guest, um, Alan Brennan. Alan grew up in Bergen County, um, in both Cliffside Park and Edgewater, um, with the sounds of Palisades Park raining down on him from the Palisades Cliffs. Um, he's an Emmy Award winner has worked in television on LA Law, The New Twilight Zone, The New Outer Limits, and China Beach. He wrote for the comic industry for DC Comics and created the character of Barbara Kane for, for the Batman universe. Um, and Alan is um, a best-selling author. His books include M M Molokai? Molokai. Molokai. Molokai, Honolulu, daughter of Mono, uh, Molokai, and one of the most enjoyable novels I have ever read, Palisades Park. Um, Alan, did I miss anything? <laughs> no, no, although Palisades Park is also available in a handy paperback edition. Yes. Uh, it's great to be here, Vince. Th thank you, Alan. It, it's, it's, it's an honor to have you here and all of, all of my guests tonight. Um, I couldn't be more proud to be with all you guys uh, here, you know, for the folks that are watching. Um, Alan, let, let me ask you a question about your book, Palisades Park. Mm -hmm. it, it's, an, it's a fiction. Uh, it revolves around a family called the Stopka family. Um, can you give us a, a little synopsis about the book? Well, the main character of the book is uh, the uh, little girl, Antoinette, um, Tony Stopka. 
And she grows up at um, Palisades Park, uh, seeing you know her her parents Eddie and Adele are concessionaires. They actually own the French fry uh, concession in this alternate universe. And uh, she grows up seeing the high divers like Arthur Holden, uh, you know, diving a hundred feet into a tank of water three feet deep. And uh, this becomes an obsession with her. And she grows up. Her dream is to become a high diver. Everyone in the family has kind of quirky dreams. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's a family saga uh, set against the background of Palisades Amusement Park, something I knew very, very well from my childhood because we always lived like within a mile of the park and it was a big part of my childhood. As it was for so many people, mm -hmm. my, myself, I mean, you know, anybody who lived in the area, mm -hmm. it, it was just a great place to be so close to. Yeah, I have, I have uh, friends in the comic book bi business who say they saw the little ads for Palisades in, uh, uh, in the comics that had Superman holding a, a scale replica of Palisades. Mm -hmm. And they said, and we, it looked so magical and we wanted to go to where they're so badly. You lucky bastard, you actually got to go there. <laughs> now, although the Stupka family in your book is fictitious, you... Um, not only is the setting very realistic and very accurate um, as a person who grew up in Cliffside Park, um, it was a treat to read a book that talks about walking down Knox Avenue past Epiphany Church. And I'm saying, wow, it's like, it's like I'm there. Um, but you also built your book around some real life characters um, that worked at the park. Um, tell us about Bunty Hill. Bunty Hill was um, a lifeguard uh, at Palisades, uh, but but he's really probably best known for the fact that uh, well he was he was a, a life, lifelong swimmer. Uh, he loved the Hudson River. Um, most days the, when he wasn't working, he could be found down at Hazard's Dock, um, and he became uh, kind of the uh, a swim guru for generations of kids from. Cliffside Park in Fort Lee. He taught them how to swim, often in the Hudson River, which we all think about now when we go, oh my God, are they, <laughs> yeah, are they still alive uh, <laughs> or radioactive? But, um, but he would, he would uh, uh, the story goes that every day, uh, every year on his birthday, he would swim the width of the park, when swim across, uh, the swim of the river rather, he would go from the uh, New Jersey side to the New York side and back again. That's a challenge. Uh, yeah, yeah, and he did it. He did it until very late in life. I think he died in his uh, in his late seventies, and he he did it. Uh, still did it in his early seventies. Now, another another character in your book was Arthur Holden. Arthur Holden was also another interesting. These were all, these were all really interesting characters, and I say not not the sense that they're fictitious characters, but they were real characters as as human beings. Uh, Arthur made his the name a name for himself as a uh, high diver by jumping off the Brooklyn Bridge uh, back in the 20s, or perhaps in the teens. And uh, that was about a, a hundred feet high, and he actually managed to survive the, uh, the dive, uh, and that got him going in the business. And by the 1930s, he was the uh, featured uh, high diver at Palisades. Um, but, but also in the 30s, he had a car accident, which laid him up for months. And after that, uh, Irving Rosenthal was a little nervous about asking him to jump 100 foot into a tank full of three feet of water, understandably. Um, and he sort of, he let him go. And this really depressed Arthur. He thought he could still do the job. He was 56 years old and he felt like he was washed up. And he decided he was going to get his job back or just not have to worry about it. And he walked over to the George Washington Bridge and climbed up onto the, uh, going on the little pedestrian walkway, he climbed up onto the fencing. And he was intending to jump off the uh, George Washington Bridge. And if he survived, get his job back. <laughs> uh, and if he didn't survive, eh, you know. Um, but he, uh, the, the, Fort, the Fort Lee police luckily intercepted him. His, his wife called him and said, my, my husband's about to dive off the George Washington Bridge which was 200 feet high. But you know, he was good. He might've been able to make it. He could have, he could have. But he was doing that high dive way before the Rosenthal's. I mean, he was, he was doing it even when yeah. the Skank brothers uh, owned the park. He was, he was. Yeah. And so it was a great blow to him to lose that, uh, that job. Sure. Needless to say, he got the job back right after he tried to jump off the George Washington.
Yeah, yeah. You know. And n- another character I remember in your book was uh, one of the concessionaires, Minette. Minette Dobson was a, uh, a showgirl, uh, a dancer. She uh, toured the nation in various reviews uh, in, the, uh, in the 20s. Uh, she was uh, from the, uh, uh, the Cliffside Park area. And she always, she worked as a concessionaire. It was a cigarette wheel, I believe, uh, for, uh, which was uh, owned by a real, local real estate de- uh, uh, developer with whom she was having a long running affair. Um, and uh, she was a character too. Um, I talked to her, uh, her nephew, Gary, and her niece, Georgia, and they told me that after the park closed, uh, Minette and her sister opened up a dress shop in uh, Point Pleasant. And, um, uh, in, and she was in her late 60s, and she said, Aunt Minette could still dance the rumba on a tabletop. <laughs> Nice. And I learned about I learned about her and a lot of others from a woman named Norma Santanello, who uh, uh, graciously granted me two uh, long interviews. She she grew up playing in crates uh, that used to contain china uh, ware that was um, a uh, a prize in the concession that her uh, her parents ran at Palisades. And when she grew up, she inherited the uh, concession, and uh, she gave me a huge amount of. Of, of wealth of detail about the people who, uh, who, uh, who, who live there, because that's really what I wanted to do. I, you can't write a book that's you know, just out of nostalgia. Uh, and although it had that nostalgia for me, I wanted to know about the people who made the park what it was, you know, the staff, the performers, sure. the, uh, uh, the concessionaires, and Norma really filled in all of, that, uh, all of that for me. I mean, she knew where all the bodies were buried. Yes. Now, the, the, the extensive research you did on that book just absolutely floored me. Um, I remember one time you called me with a question about, um, I think it was about Arthur Holden's trunks. You asked me what color trunks <laughs> did he wear? And I had no idea. I said, let me get back to you. And I looked in all the newspaper articles I had. Nothing mentioned his trunks. I, I called you back. I said, I'm sorry, I can't help you. And then you called me back a few weeks later and you said they were blue. Uh, I, you, you know, most people who's writing fiction would just say, all right, I'm going to call them blue or I'm going to call them red. Um, but why do you do that? Why do you go into such detail? I mean, it's certainly for me as a reader, it certainly made it much more interesting. I, I do it because I'm, clin- I'm clinically insane. Uh, <laughs> that, that explains this is, it. This is not something that a rational person would do, but I... I, I have this belief, I mean, first of all, I really want to immerse the reader in as many details as possible to, 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 to recreate the past as closely as I can manage it, uh, whether I was part of it or, or not. And, and, I, and I really do feel like if you just make that stuff up, and let's face it, sometimes we all have to just make the stuff up. When you can't find a, you know, a thing, if I, if I hadn't been able to found, find out the color of the trunks, I would have said, ah, they're red, you know? Yeah. But, you, I try to get it as accurately as possible. And to me, that's the difference between writing a historical novel and writing a period piece. Uh, I write historical novels, and so I, I, I feel obligated to have that level of detail, which is why it takes me so long to write these things. Well, I think you said one word in your description just now that I think for me as a reader, it, it, it hit home. You said immerse because that's exactly what your book did as I was reading it. I, I really felt I was back in time, um, not only when they were talking about Palisades and it was you know, the eras that were long before I was born, um, but you know, as they would progress throughout the, the, the towns or, or you know, throughout places in Jersey, um, I certainly felt that I was immersed in, in the whole scene. It was like stepping into a time machine with your, the way you wrote it. Well, thank you. That, that's, that's what I intended. I, I really do. I mean, I, before I wrote historical novels, I wrote, I wrote science fiction and fantasy. And there's uh, science fiction and historical novels have one thing in, in common. They're both about creating worlds. Uh, in, in SF, it's a, a future world. In historicals, it's the past. And it, uh, I was never that great at writing science fiction, uh, even though I had a couple of awards for it. Uh, but I found like I really found what I was best at when I discovered, you know, historical fiction. Mm. 
when you were researching the history of the park, was there anything that surprised you? Uh, something the that, most the ahead. most surprising thing was the was was learning that the the pool was segregated uh, because by the time I rolled around, uh, I was probably uh, five years old in 1959 when I may have gone, uh, or maybe younger than that, when I waited in the pool, in the saltwater pool for the first time. But by that time, uh, it had been desegregated, or at least largely desegregated. Mm -hmm. And so I was stunned. Uh, and uh, I knew I couldn't ignore this. Uh, it was, uh, it was a, a stain on the park's past, but I had to report it. And, uh, and, and I, I went over up to the uh, New York Public Library, the, um, 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 uh, the uh, division up, uh, up in Harlem, and they had old microfilm newspapers of African-American newspapers of the time that had a lot of detail on the efforts to desegregate the uh, Palisades Park pool. And the more I learned about it, the more I, I learned, well, this is, this is you know, not just something that should be told, you know, uh, uh, it's something that, you know, is potentially an, an exciting, you know, plot development here too. And something that my character, Tony, can be a part of as well. So, yeah. so that was most surprising uh, of it to discover that, uh, you know, oh, that the, this thing that I, I held in such esteem, you know, it did have a dark shadow in its past, but sure. luckily it, it did resolve it as did, you know, most places in the, uh, in the North. And I think that controversy really went on for three years the three biggest years, 1947 to 49, where it was every week there were protests at the park. There were people getting arrested. There were people fighting um, until, you know, eventually they, they, it, they kept it very low key when it was desegregated and people were, you know, people of all colors were allowed to, to swim in the pool. But it was kind of kept hush hush, um, which is why you and myself as well, you know, when we got to know the pool. We didn't know anything about the, uh, uh, the problems that they had back in the 40s. And Irving Rosenthal claimed that, um, uh, I think his nieces told me that he said that uh, uh, he, um, you know, he only, he only did it because he thought that white people would not go in a pool with, uh, with black people. Right. And ap after that proved wrong, he said, well, I should have done this years ago. Yeah, yeah. Now, your latest work um, is a uh, comic book, um, mm -hmm. Submariner Marvel's uh, Snapshot Number One. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. And I have you have a cover uh, of the uh, edition that I sent you. That was a limited edition. Uh, yeah, that's the that is a limited edition cover that was drawn by Jerry Ordway, who drew the uh, the the fantastic art in the interior. Um, and that's, uh, that's, and that's, that's, the, a, that's the that's the cyclone coaster they're fighting. That's the cyclone coaster, <laughs> and it's a, it's a they, we use the old logo. I insisted using the actual logo because the story is set in 1946, and I wanted the logo from 1946. There's another cover which I will show you in a moment, which is actually the one that is uh, more ca more common. That is uh, the splash page of. Uh, uh, of the story. Uh, Jerry Ordway is a remarkable artist. He is uh, meticulous when it comes to historical detail. He worked from research materials that I provided him and that he could find on the internet and he bought, on, uh, 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 bought himself. And he did just a fabulous job presenting, you know, the park. Uh, and and you, wrote, would... you wrote the story that this is... Oh, yes, I wrote the script. I wrote the script. Uh, I was approached by my friend Kurt Busick who was editing this series. And uh, he, uh, he said, you know, these could, stories could be set anywhere in time. You know, this could be, oh, you know, the Submariner goes out with uh, his girlfriend, Betty Dean, to Palisades Amusement Park. And of course, he threw that into me as an inducement, as if that would really tip me to do it. <laughs> and, and I told him later, I said, Kurt, you had me at Betty Dean. <laughs> so I, I love that period of, I, I love the characters, the Marvel characters from the 1940s. And they'd never gotten the chance to write them before. This is actually the cover, the Alex Ross cover, that is the most common one. So if anybody wants to uh, search this out, this is the one that you will be, that, the, that well, you'll find it the easiest and it's the, it's the cheapest too. Um, but it was, uh, it was really kind of a, 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 a joy to write because I, was, I got to write this, uh, uh, these characters I loved. I, I wrote a real old-fashioned Marvel slugfest between uh, Submariner and uh, a villain called the Shark, 
And I'm afraid in the process, they wreck half of Palisades Amusement Park. It um, happens, right? It happens. <laughs> you know, I, I felt a little guilty because I managed to, you know, I brought it back after the fire and my novel. And here I go and I have them wreck it all over again. But, uh, but it was a lot of fun to write. And I'm glad that uh, I was able to contribute one more addition to, uh, uh, to Palisades Park ephemera. Nice. Do you have anything new in the works that you're working on? Anything you could share with us? Uh, I just completed a 13,000 word novelette for George R. R. Martin, uh, who has, uh, edits a, a book series called Wild Cards. Uh, and uh, so I, I handed that in to him and it'll probably be uh, published online uh, next year sometime. And uh, other than that, I am working on surviving the pandemic like everybody else. Like everybody else. But plus you're in California, so uh, those fires don't pose any threat to you at the present time, I hope? No, no, we did, we did get the smoke from the, uh, the fires up north. And for about two weeks, our air quality was so bad that we couldn't go outside and exercise. Oh, uh, it, was, it was really, you, you know, the sun was orange all the time. It looked like a Martian sun. Uh, but, uh, but thankfully, we are not uh, 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 at the center of it. But I, I live in Malibu, which is a fire zone. So, you know, we're prepared like everybody else to evacuate at a moment's notice. Well, good luck to you out there. Thank you. Um, I, and I want to thank you for joining us tonight, Alan. If you can stand by, um, mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of your fans are going to have some questions for you. Um, we can open up the, the uh, floor to questions now, uh, Ken, if anybody has any questions um, yes. they want to share. Uh, whatever happened to the wild mouse? And do you have any similar history that exists about Olympic Park in Maplewood? I, I know about Olympic Park. Um, I think there was a book that was published by the same publisher of my original book, uh, Rutgers University Press. Um, I think it was called Smiles, uh, A History of Olympic Park. Um, and as far as the wild mouse, no, it was torn down. Most of the, uh, most, almost everything that was in the park that was wooden uh, was torn down uh, when they closed in 71. Um, the, I was surprised to find out that the cars from the cyclone had survived. I assume that was, that was destroyed when they tore down the cyclone. Um, but we found those uh, a couple of years ago in a barn down in Pennsylvania and, and, uh, we, we rescued one of those and got it back up here. Um, that's on display at the museum, in fact, or at least the front panel of it is, um, uh, uh so that's it. Yeah, the wild mouse okay. is, is destroyed. But, but I'll tell you this, if you go to the museum, the building permit for the wild mouse is on display. So you'll get to see that up close and personal. I think this is probably a question for Glenn. Uh, what was your pay per hour and did you make any money? For, for Gene? Oh, Gene, I'm sorry. Yeah, Gene. Do you remember what you got paid, Gene? No, it was probably minimum wage. Um, you know, they, they, they really didn't pay much. You know, what I, I, I really don't remember what the... When I talk to folks who worked at the park who only got $3 a week or whatever it was, you know, most people had the same reaction, and you probably would, would concur with this, Gene, I think, is that it didn't really matter how much you got paid because it was such a family... Um, it was such a, you felt like you were part of a, of a bigger family. Um, and I'm sure it was fun to work there. So going I, you know, to the park was not Maynard G. Krebs work. It was <laughs> just the availability. Wow. I can go in the park. I got a job in the park. Yeah. I'm making lemonades next to French fries. Sure. Come on. Bra Bur you and, had bragging rights to all and of one all year, your... one year I had a pass to the pool. I had my, uh, you know, my key for around my ankle. Yep. I was living large, living large. Nice. <laughs> Does anyone have any memories of Superman and Batman rides? Well, there were two Batman rides. There was the Bat Slide, um, which was basically you climbed up these stairs, like a spiral staircase. When you got to the top, um, they gave you a burlap sack to sit on, and you would just go down this chute that spiraled around the outside of the building. Um, of course, because in 66 or so, that, that's when the Batman series was so popular. 
uh, the, the park had deals with DC Comics and Archie Comics. Um, so they just got the rights to Batman. And Superman, I don't think, had any rides. But Superman was frequently used in their advertisements. Uh, you know, he'd be standing there all spectacular. And he would say, be my guest. Come on over to Palisades Amusement Park. Was I don't Palisade think I tried to use that in my book somewhere. But I just couldn't do it. <laughs> Uh, was Palisades considered more of a neighborhood park or did it have a much larger impact on the popular imagination compared to a really huge park like Great Adventure or even Coney Island? Did, Palis did the Palisades exhibit have the same influence? Well, Palisades was huge. Um, it was, uh, there were times when it was as popular, if not more popular than Coney Island. So it was, a, you know, and part of that was because in 62, Freddie Cannon came out with the, uh, with the song Palisades Park. And, you know, that got people from across the country, you know, really across the globe, you know, who heard the record to wonder what this, what this place was that he was singing about. And, um, and he also advertised in comic books, which at the time, didn't have regional advertising like we have today. So when they, ad when they put an ad with Superman saying, be my guest and come on over to Palisades Park, everybody who, who bought this comic, for, whether it be here in the New York area or out in California or even in England, you know, they saw these ads, uh, you know, of Superman saying, come to Palisades Amusement Park. So it was not, a, it was not by any means considered a local park. It was, it was far bigger than that. Um, but for us, if we lived in town, it was our park. Where was a picture taken with the airplane? I don't remember that at the park. Uh, I'm not sure what. Not sure what that what, means. What, one of the founders was standing by an airplane. One of the brothers was standing oh, by. Oh, 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 oh. That was a, uh, I think that was a promotion for a ride called, um, Mac, Mac, who who was the general in in World War Two? Sorry, MacArthur. Yeah, MacArthur. MacArthur. I think it was called MacArthur's Bombers. It was a ride, and I think they had that there as part of that promotion. I think that's that was what that uh, uh, photo was from. Any movies made at Palisade Park? There were TV shows. There were quite a number of TV shows that were filmed at Palisades. I, I can't think of any movies other than the posters that were used in West Side Story. You, you saw Palisades Music Park posters uh, frequently in that movie. And um, in The Godfather, Gene, you know what I'm talking about with, with the, in The Godfather? The, there's one scene that for years I never knew it until I got a Blu-ray and saw the high definition version of this scene where... Um, they're pulling up to Louie's restaurant where uh, Michael is meeting to, to, uh, to do in uh, the bad guy. Best veal in the city. Yeah, the best veal in the city. And as they pull up to the, to the front of Louie's, there's a Palisades Amusement Park poster on the, on the wall right next to, uh, right to Louie's. But you, yeah. you know, in the original version, you didn't really see it because it was no. dark. But they, they, they brightened it up as, you know, as new versions of that the, the, the uh, Godfather were released. Are there any fine art paintings of the park anywhere? Boy, there's one on, on YouTube, I, I mean on eBay, that has been there for at least the last 12 years. And, and the guy wants some, I don't know, $37,000 for it. It's not even that good. It's, in my opinion. So I, I don't know, I guess it's fine art because he wants 37,000 for it. <laughs> yeah, somebody made a comment that silent films were made along the Palisades, but I would imagine that's before the park was there. No, 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 no. The park, the park opened in 1898. Oh, and, okay. and, you know, most of the silent films, there were at least three that I found, well, four, including one from Fatty Arbuckle, um, that were filmed at Palisades, in, in Palisades Park. Um, a couple of them you can't really tell um, because they didn't film rides, but they filmed like an entrance. But there was a, uh, a, the very first Pearl White Perils of Pauline 
uh, there was a scene that was filmed in Palisades Park. Um, so yeah, in the, in the early days, because remember, there wasn't a California, uh, there wasn't a Hollywood California uh, in the early days of movies. It was Fort Lee, New Jersey, um, which is one of the towns that Palisades was in. So it, it became, you know, a perfect uh, uh, setting for a lot, of, a lot of those early films. Does anyone remember being dared to go under the waterfall while swimming at the pool? Uh, I didn't. I wasn't. There. Oh yeah, and there was a room in the back. That behind you behind the falls. Behind the falls, yeah, yeah. yeah there was a door, and you, you can go through it and and come out the other side. Uh, and you did that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's, we won't tell. <laughs> we do have a relative here, though, who 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 may scold you. <laughs> I never told you where the uh, gate was in the fence. The, the hole in the fence. <laughs> the hole in the fence. Yes. It was right by Anna's house on the east side of the park. Ken, did you oh, see? The, did you see the link for the for the song? I did see the link for the song. Somebody's asking if we could play it. Uh, I'm having a problem with my audio uh, on my Mac, um, so I don't know if somebody else could access that. It's what, what song are we talking about? Palisades Park. The Freddie Cannon song? Yes. I believe I'm so, not, yeah. I'm not sure we have the right to play that, to tell you I don't the think truth. you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, is a free, this is a free educational event. We didn't yeah, tell you the yeah. Tell it to the judge, you know what I mean? <laughs> Was there a theme song for the park? The the theme song, the come on over theme song. Yeah, maybe that's what they're talking about. Uh, I don't have it handy. I mean, maybe I could the, get the it. February, the February program, you can dig that up for the February. Yeah, yeah, actually, it, forward to it. it is part of the the, uh, the February program, so. Great. So there's another reason you want to be there on February 20th. Great. Any other questions? I think we covered everything. All right. Um, well, you know, I want to I want to say, remember, folks, you can get a autographed copy of this book if you go to the uh, mawamuseum.org, and um, remember the proceeds from the book there will go to the museum, and I will autograph it before we ship it to you. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. I especially want to thank my guests um, who were with us tonight. Um, remember, if you, if you enjoyed this webinar, please let me know. You could write me at Vince at palisadespark.com. Um, I enjoyed it. What, well, I know you enjoyed it. <laughs> but I, I want to thank my guests, Gene Focarelli, uh, Donald Jacoby, Chris Page, and Alan Brenner. Thank you guys for, for being here tonight. It was an honor uh, to be with you tonight. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I did. I want to thank Ken Pokrowski. Sorry, Ken. Pokrowski. Pokrowski uh, and, <laughs> and Adam, uh, who, who were working for us behind the uh, scenes, Charlie Carreras, um, and Kathy Hadjo from the museum uh, for putting this all together. Please, folks, um, uh, support the one, museum. One more. One yep. more thing, uh, Vinny. Uh, thank you, Vinny, because you are the brainchild behind all of this. We haven't emphasized enough that we're open on Saturdays from one to four, and we have all appropriate uh, uh, protocols for being safe, 10 people at a time, proper sanitation, uh, fiberglass for the desk, and, and so forth and so on. So, so please consider coming by to see all the great things that Vinny's been talking about and uh, we look forward to all of you participating on February the 20th. So please uh, uh, become a member and send, send a donation. Um, one more thing, one more question. Uh, somebody's asking where they could hear the recording of the theme song. I believe you could probably get that on YouTube. Yeah, I, I have it on YouTube. Um, if you just ser search for the Palisades Amusement Park jingle, um, I... Uh, I, somebody donated to me some footage, original film footage that was used for the commercial. And I was able to put that all together with the song because there was no audio with the, with the film uh, footage she gave me, but I put that together with the song. So you get to see the original commercial 
uh, what it looked like for Palisades. And you'll hear the jingle there. So just search for Palisades Amusement Park jingle on YouTube and you'll find it. Vince, I want to thank you for keeping the memory of the park uh, alive. My pleasure, Donald. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to say good night. Adios. Good night. Thanks, Bob.